Okay. You're up, baby. Uh-huh. So this is Christina Kimbrell. Christina and I met, y'all know, remember Roger Munchen? Roger is one of, the, uh, just a mighty man of God. He's been on the cover of Victorious Living, Hold Up Rescue Not Arrested Bibles. So it was one of these Bibles while she was in an Arizona facility that got a hold of her heart. God spoke to her. She gave her life to the Lord. She got these Bibles and she studied. She ended up, when she got released, she began, um, working with Roger and being a volunteer through correspondence. She was one of his speakers at a volunteer event, and I was one of the speakers in Arizona, and we met. And I saw her on a video talking about her overcoming the things that she's gonna share, and I said, that is the most beautiful woman, and one of the most wise women and well-spoken women I've ever heard. So I went and found her in the food line, tap, not food lion, but the food line, and I said, can I have your story? I have a magazine, and I'd love to, pre to print it. And uh, she said I, she about wanted to run from me, I think, but uh, she's going to tell you how God took that meeting, brought her dreams full circle, and now she is the Victorious Living Production Manager, creative team writer, and a mighty woman of God, Christine. Amen. I was so encouraged when I walked in this room and, and just heard the worshiping that was going on here. Like Christy said, um, we, we come from two previous events today, and I, I was a little weary when I walked in here, but just the power of the Holy Spirit in this room just energized me for this last little leg of our journey tonight, and I just want to thank you gentlemen for that. Every time that I have the privilege of going into a prison, whether it's a men's or women's prison, it's always such a surreal experience because I've been to prison three times, but not where I could leave when I wanted to. And so, so it's a surreal experience, but I always end up getting energized and reminded and just filled with gratitude and just humbled by the opportunity that God would allow me to come back in here or anywhere that he leads me and share a little bit of my story and encourage you gentlemen. Um, I just want to tell you that the world out there, no matter how long you've been in here, whether it's years and years or a couple years, the world out there is crying for revival. And they're looking out there in the churches for revival. And I think that they may be confused because I think that the revival may be taking place in the, in the prisons across the country. Uh, at the end here that I want to just uh, put a, a, the word in your heart. Um, I, we, one of our uh, scriptures that we use at Victoria's Living uh, Magazine is that we defeat the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. Amen. And um, just the mere fact that I'm standing here today is a, is a miracle because my story started out um, just kind of getting broken really early in life. Um, I, at the age of three to the age of 10, um, I was sexually molested by three different individuals. And so I just got off to a bad start. That was just a really, my, my spirit and emotionally, I was broken in a way that a 10 year old just couldn't process. I just couldn't process it. And I didn't have a lot of support at home. Um, I had a stepfather. I lost my, my real father in a drunk driving accident when I was 18 months old. So um, I didn't have a father figure in my life per se. Um, the stepfather that I had didn't want kids, he didn't like kids, and he had no problem letting me know that I wasn't wanted. So I kind of grew up with that, and I ended up leaving home at 13 years old, and I hit the streets. And because no one was protecting me and no one was really looking after me, I became vulnerable to a life that um, I thought I was old enough to deal with, but I really wasn't. I was a child surviving on the streets. And it's, that was back in like the 80s, 
and it's so much um, different now, but even back then, it, the streets were vicious for a 13, 14 year old. Um, I became a heroin and a crack addict before um, my 18th birthday, so that by the time I turned 18, I was in prison. Six months after I turned 18, I went to prison for the first time. I've been to prison three times after that. Can anybody tell me the definition of insanity? Okay, so I started a cycle as a teenager and, I, and, and when I went to prison for the first time, and then that cycle of insanity just went on and on and on for 30 years of my life, you know, and everything that goes along with it. And um, by the time I was 44 years old, this was back in 2015, um, I was spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically broken and dead and bankrupt. And I had gotten arrested. Um, I, was, I knew I was going to be on my way to prison for the third time. I weighed 92 pounds. I, if I had not gotten arrested, I would be dead. I, I wouldn't have made it. And this was before fentanyl and before, you know, it's just, that was just six years ago, but things have progressed so much over the years, you know. But I know that the Lord reached down from heaven, pulled me off the streets and rescued me because he had a purpose for me that I knew nothing about. Um, but on the floor of a jail cell in Pima County Jail, I cried out to God and I was like, either just make me stop breathing or help me. I don't care which at this point, but I cannot keep doing this. He met me on that jail cell floor. Um, I didn't realize it was him at first. It was like a feeling of just a warm blanket or something, you know, that enabled me to keep breathing and keep eating and keep getting through the heroin withdrawals and getting a little stronger and a little stronger. But he had something up his sleeve when he put me in a room, a two-man cell with a girl who I knew from the streets. So I didn't really think she was too credible. But all she wanted to do was talk about Jesus. And I was trapped in this room with her. I couldn't get out. And so, so I was trapped in there with her for like two months. And all she wanted to do was talk about Jesus. And little by little by little, by her sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope um, that she had apparently found from this man who, who died, who gave his life and died a death he didn't deserve just so that I could have eternal life. I mean, that became more and more and more appealing to me. Um, and it was something that I had never tried before. I had tried everything else, every other rehab, you know, uh, all of it. And, and nothing, nothing could touch the places that were broken in my heart and provide any sense of healing. And nothing, um, I, I just couldn't change. I was incapable of changing. Even more so, I didn't have a desire to change prior to Jesus coming into my heart. The Word of God says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Quite honestly, I didn't desire to change prior to that moment. But when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I had a desire to change. I didn't know what that looked like. I had a desire to stay clean and sober. I had a desire. Something was pulling me to this Bible. And I was learning things that were undoing all of the lies that the enemy had told me all my life that had kept me in bondage, um, that had caused me to lose my two children. So I came from a broken home, and then I perpetuated the cycle in my home because I lost my kids to CPS because of my addiction. Um, but the, the, the Word of God started to undo all of that. and. Little by little, through my my last prison sentence from 2015 to 2017, um, God wrote his word on my heart. And I, I stepped out of prison in 2017, a new creation in Christ. Amen. I, I had the hope of Jesus, but I also was like, Lord, if you just will help me stay clean and sober, and you just will help me finish parole, I will have a fighting chance. Those were the insurmountable odds against me at that moment in my life, right? That was huge. But I knew if I could do those two things, that 
everything that this Bible was telling me, that, that the promises that were mine, that was attainable, right? That, that was something that was real. So um, I got out of prison in December of 2017, and about four months after I got released, I started serving with Roger at Rescued Not Arrested, packaging the Bibles. That if you would write to his ministry anytime between 2018 and 2020, um, I was packaging those Bibles. I would read your mail. Um, occasionally, I would give you know letters to Roger and be like, "Hey, this person's writing to you." You know, just pray over your letters and stuff like that. And little did I know that God was setting me up for a divine appointment with Christy Overton Johnson at a volunteer appreciation dinner in 2020, um, where. I had shared my testimony with the other volunteers for Rescued Not Arrested and, you know, just thanked them because somebody had done for me what I was now doing for other people, which was packaging, packaging that Bible, and it changed the trajectory of my life. Um, so when I met Christy and I submitted my story in 2020, I was allowed to become part of the ministry team at a time when and if any of you were here in 2020, that was one of the darkest, most desolate times that any inmates in any facility across the country experienced, right? Lockdown, no family, it was awful. And I it was such a privilege to be a part of this ministry team at that time because more than ever before, you guys needed the hope of Jesus. Amen. You needed a, a light in the darkness that Victorious Living Magazine was able to provide, am I right? Yeah. That was huge for me, but I, I had no idea what God was doing at that time. I remembered that when I was eight, eight years old, back at this time when I was going through all this mess as a child, um, a woman had come to my uh, fifth grade class and she said, she did a writing contest and I won this writing contest. And she came back and she's like, you could be a journalist someday. You are gonna be a writer someday. She took me on a personal field trip to the University of Arizona. I met professors. I met news reporters at the local newspaper. And she really sold me this dream. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a writer someday. Well, I went to prison and I never graduated high school. I got my GED in prison. So the fact that I would become a journalist for Jesus was the most amazing thing. I submitted my testimony um, to Christy and she published it. And after that, she invited me to continue to write. And I had this passion, this burning passion. I have the keys to freedom and I want to tell everybody that Jesus saves. He saves. He can do it. It. And so about a year and a half into that, she got me on a Zoom call, and she's like, I need help. And I was like, okay, well, what can I do? And, and I, I was offered an opportunity to become a permanent part of this team, which is exceedingly abundantly far more than I could have ever asked or imagined for myself, even with Jesus, even when I walked out of prison in 2017, a new creation in Christ, my new creation in Christ clothes, they were a little big and they were a little itchy, but they were a new creation in Christ clothes nonetheless. And he has uh, grown me from glory to glory to glory to glory until I stand before you today. And um, I, I want to encourage those of you that raised your hands that you are fathers. Your testimony, we defeat the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And there is an army just in this room of men that are needed in your families. There's a, a lost generation out there, and God is raising up an army just in this room alone, and it's so powerful, and it's so encouraging. I grew up without a father. My two daughters grew up without their father, and, and it, it hurts them, right? It, it does, because they don't understand. Um, why their father isn't in their life and he's made other choices and so you know god has provided 
may the ability to fill in the gap somewhere, but I can never take the place of their father in their life. And so I want to commend you, whether you are walking out tomorrow or whether you never walk out of here again, that does not take away from your, the power that Jesus Christ will give you to affect change in your children's lives and in your family's lives through your testimony. And if you want to know the power of the testimony, the story of the woman at the well, I met a man who told me everything I ever did, come see, right? And she changed a whole community of people because they met the Messiah that, that died for them, right? And I just want to leave you guys, I'm going to, look, I'm 50, okay, and i got to wear these readers. I'm grateful to be 50 because that wasn't even part of the plan as far as I was concerned. I'm lucky to be alive. I'm going to put these on. If you ever want to know, um, you know, about how God sees the heart and, and will work through anybody, um, the life of King David, right? King David, he failed miserably. He, he did a lot of stuff, right? But God still used him mightily. And he, he was a father. And he, um, he said this to God. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, my God, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Aren't these cute? <laughs> you, Lord God, have looked on me as though I were the most exalted of men. And he is looking down on every single one of you gentlemen in here, you mighty men of God, who have accepted Jesus into your heart if you have. And and if you're in this room and you haven't accepted Jesus, know that he's knocking on the door of your heart and extending that invitation of grace and mercy to you as well. And he's looking down on your family and you're going to be the image bearer of him in your family and break cycles that are, that are going to be powerful and, and end up... Life after life after life, one little ripple at a time, changing the world out there that is dying and lost and broken. So thank you guys for continuing to seek the Lord. Oh, yeah. Sheridan? Good job, Sheridan. Stay quiet right the time. Okay, so we got counts. I'm going to It's going to be quiet. Yeah, just going to be calm.